Hey everybody, I'm JJ, you're watching Reality Survival. So today we are gonna talk about how to stay safe from nuclear fallout. Now, let me stay right here at the outset that I do not think that there is a really high likelihood that there would be any kind of a nuclear war between Russia and the United States. But everybody's talking about it. And so I thought maybe it would be a good time to do a video on this discussing the reality of you know what you really need to do to stay safe uh, in, in that kind of an instance, all right? Um, now this is gonna be a pretty long video, so uh, you might wanna put it on times two <laughs> if, you're, if you have a, a low attention span, um, or just you know get some popcorn and, <laughs> and settle in. Um, I think that, I, you know, unless you're a, a nuclear weapons expert or you know, you're really, really up on this stuff, I think that you guys are gonna learn something. You're gonna pick up some stuff here because there's a lot of myths about radiation and fallout and uh, you know how it's like, what it's like after nuclear bombs go off. So I encourage you to, to stick with me here and, and listen to this. It's gonna, it's gonna take a little bit though. All right, so uh, first off here, one, one, one of the main things you need to know is after a nuclear explosion uh, has been detonated close to the ground or at ground level, and I'm just, I'm reading some notes here that I've put together on, on uh, Evernote. Um, there will be a large amount of uh, nuclear fallout that is highly dangerous to humans. You need to try to avoid this fallout and stay sheltered until it loses its potency. And that doesn't take as long as you think it does. I'll, I'll explain that here in a minute. Um, exposure to the fallout can cause acute radiation sickness or even lead to death. It can cause exterior burns if it gets on your skin and also it will burn your lungs if it's breathed in. Even though your home may not have been close in proximity to the actual detonation site, it could still be located within the fallout path because of winds and that kind of thing. And that means that you need to know how to stay safe from nuclear fallout because the wind directions could change at any time after a detonation and bring fallout your way, whether or not you are expecting it to do so. There are three really important things to remember when it comes to nuclear fallout and how to stay safe from it, and that is time, distance, and shielding. First, we're gonna talk about time. And, and pretty much all the information here, uh, it was very, it was gathered from multiple sources, but most of it comes from, um, I think his name is Crescent's book on, um, on nuclear war, how to survive nuclear war. And I'll throw a picture of the, of it in here. I'll also link to that PDF, uh, down in the description below, um, as well. Okay. So, uh, time when most people think of how long radiation stays deadly, they, uh, think in terms of years and not hours. And that is partially true if the radiation is still connected to its source material. But after it's been released during an explosion, it actually begins to de decay pretty rapidly. Now, I'm gonna throw in a graphic here where you guys can take a look at it and you can see um, on the left-hand side of the graph here, we have the dose rate and that's measured in rentgens, which we'll talk more about that in another lesson coming up here soon too. Um, and then along the bottom axis, we're, we're looking at hours after the explosion, okay? So, 1,000, 1,000 rentgens per hour is a massive amount of radiation dose, and it would be very close to a nuclear site, uh, and that would be a lethal, that would be a lethal dose. But you can see that just two hours after the initial explosion, that 1,000 uh, rentgen per hour dose is now down to 480 rentgens per hour. Now, 480 rentgens per hour is lethal to approximately 50% of people who would be exposed to that. Um, so you can see that in just two hours, it's actually dropped quite a bit. After seven hours, we're down to 100 rentgen, rentgens per hour, which is very survivable for most people. After 14 hours, it's 43 rentgens per hour. And after 48 hours, it's 10 rentgens per hour. So, um, which at 10 rentgens per hour, you would likely not have any real side effects. There's not been very many studies on long-term radiation exposure and how much it takes to potentially cause long-term cancer risk. 
but in the short term, you would not see any, any real issues. Okay, so the good news story here is that with as little as two to three full days in an adequate shelter, uh, you may be able to move to evacuate the area even if you were fairly close to a detonation site. Uh, these, vari these variables are all relative based on the actual payload of the device and if it, it was detonated, um, but and, you know, and how it was detonated and all that kind of stuff. But what I'm really trying to show you here to get you to understand is, is that time is on your side. Okay, if you can shelter for two to three days, that is going to dramatically decrease the potential amount of radiation that you would be exposed to. It's not, you know, months on end that you'd have to go to. Um, even in a really bad situation, if you had a really good shelter, um, you know, two weeks is like the way outside limit. Okay, uh, that's way on the outside. All right, and, and like the worst case kind of you know, kind of scenario. Okay, so now let's talk about distance. We said the three things are time, distance, and shielding. So with distance, what we need to understand here is the inverse square law. The inverse square law states that the intensity of a source of radiation changes in inverse proportion to the square of the distance from the source. Now, I'm terrible at math, so take a look at this graphic to help you understand a little bit better. To put it in simpler terms, this means that as you move away from an energy source, the strength decreases and the decrease is directly related to the distance from the source. The further away, the less potent the radiation is to you. Okay, and I'll put a link down in the description to a study.com article that explains a little bit more about the inverse square law if you want to know more about the math on that. Um, when we're looking at this graph, what we can see here is we're looking at the dose on the vertical side, and then we are looking at the intensity on the bottom scale. And you can kind of see on the, on the graphic representation on the panels how it's more concentrated when you're really close, and it becomes at you know twice the distance, it's half as, half as um, intense, and then three times the distance, you know, even, even more or less intense, all right? So if you can get away from whatever the radioactive fallout is, the further you can get away from it, the better you are, and the lower that that amount will be. So remember that when we're talking about uh, creating a shelter uh, in your home or in another building or something like that here in a little bit. Okay, so time, distance, and shielding. Shielding is kind of the one primary way to reduce radiation that you can control, probably more so than the others, depending on where you're at when it all happens. Here's the main thing you need to remember, is you want to put as much mass between you and the radiation source as possible. The denser the mass, the better, but it doesn't really matter. Anything will work, okay? Mass is what stops, or more accurately, absorbs uh, radiation. And we're talking about gamma radiation here, okay? Um, the, th the thicker and heavier or the more dense the mass is, the more radiation it'll stop and the more effective it is with every inch or more that you add to the outside of your fallout shelter. Now, I'm going to be throwing in some uh, graphics so you guys can see some different examples of, you know, just uh, expediently made fallout shelters. This doesn't have to be a big fancy doomsday bunker. It's just, you know, it could be anything built in your basement or even in your house if you didn't have a basement, anything like that. All right. Um, all right. So how much mass do you need? The thickness in inches needed to cut the radiation down to only one tenth of its initial intensity for different common materials is as follows. For steel, you need 3.3 inches thick. Concrete, 11 inches thick. Earth, 18 inches thick. Water, 24 inches thick. Wood, 38 inches thick. Now these are approximates, right? The thickness, re to requ the thickness required to stop 99% of the radiation. For steel, it's 5 inches. For solid brick or hollow concrete blocks filled with mortar or sand, it's 16 inches. Packed earth is 24 inches. 
Loose earth is 36 inches and water is 36 inches. By the way, just as a point of interest, um, lead is really nothing special. Um, it's the same as anything else pound for pound. It's used on medical gowns mostly because it's easily made flexible, but it's still a dense material. Okay. Um, so, you may not have enough steel available, but anything that you do have uh, with mass can be used to add your shielding. Literally, anything can help. All right, so um, just remember that it takes more thickness of a lighter and less dense object. Um, so, for example, wood or books, would you need to have that be thicker than if you had heavy packed earth um, you know, to absorb and stop the same amount of radiation. All right, so the goals of your fallout shelter are going to be to maximize the distance away from the fallout dusting outside on the ground, roof, and trees. Okay, so let's say that you're going to build a shelter in your house. You're going to try to find a place inside your home, preferably in the basement if possible. Um, and you want it to be, you want it to be as far away when you look at the structure you want it to be as far away from any of that potential radioactive fallout that is outside the home. So you want to kind of think center of the home is probably the best case scenario. All right. Now this could be this could be in your basement. It could be in a crawl space, depending on how that crawl space is uh, laid out and what is on the exterior of the crawl space. If there's piled earth against it or something along those lines, it all depends. It might be an interior corner of the home if what you know that's partially buried underground. It could be in a root cellar, a buried storm shelter. You know who knows what the case may be. If your home doesn't have a basement, uh, what about your neighbor's home? You know, think about somebody close by. Is there anybody else uh, in your neighborhood that, you know, it might be a good place to go? Remember, you're not going to have to stay in there forever. You're only talking about a few days, um, maybe a week at the longest, you know, or a couple weeks or whatever, but not very long. Okay. Um, and, you know, this is where having a group comes in handy because then, you know, maybe person X might not have a whole lot of food stocked up, but maybe she's got an awesome basement. <laughs> you know what I mean? All right, so um, you can also think about nearby commercial buildings, schools, churches, below ground parking garages, long and large culverts, large storm drains, tunnels, caves, etc. Those are all make places that you could be. With some of those, would they have open ends, you, know, you might need to um, think about fallout drifting or blowing into them. So you would want to kind of create, you know, some way to seal yourself off from that fallout or something like that if it, if it did drift in. But um, that's just, just some ideas. In an urban area where you've got taller buildings, you know, uh, especially ones with a half a dozen or more floors where there's not a concern of blast damage, then um, they might be able to provide you some decent radiation protection in the center of the middle floors. And this is because uh, both of the distance and the shielding from the multiple floors provides from the fallout on the ground and the roof. So if you had a you know six or seven story building, go to like the third or fourth floor, find some place in the center of the building, and then make a little hole up site there, pile as much mass around you as possible. Okay. Okay. So yeah, the bottom line is choose a structure nearby with both the greatest amount of mass and the greatest distance already in place between the outside where the fallout would settle and the shelter occupants on the inside. An effective uh, fallout shelter constructed in a basement could potentially reduce your radiation exposure 100 to 200 fold. Thus, if the initial radiation intensity outside was 500 rentkins per hour, which is again fatal uh, in one hour for 50% of people, the basement shelter occupants might only experience 5 rentkins per hour or even less, which is entirely survivable, as the radiation intensity will be decreasing every passing hour. So again, the longer you stay in there, it's dropping off precipitously, the radiation intensity is. Okay, so like we said, most people only need to stay in a shelter uh, full time for two to three days before coming out to be able to safely join an evacuation effort. Um, if an evacuation is even necessary, it might not. It might not be necessary. 
Again, this all depends on your location, the distance from the detonation site, and all that kind of stuff. As miserable and cramped as it might be, uh, as it might seem now, you and your family can easily endure a couple of days of that, especially compared to the alternative of dying a horrible death from radiation poisoning, because acute radiation sickness is nasty stuff. You don't want it. All right, so uh, we've taken, I've, I've thrown in some graphics here. You guys can kind of get the idea of what we're talking about. Basically, you want to create a little cubby hole just big enough for you and your family and um, you know put as much mass around it as possible. If you've got the space in a basement, you could even take some mortar bricks or some, uh, some concrete blocks and you know fill them with sand, mortar them together and just construct a wall you know uh, in a place that you could put in like four cots you know and just kind of just hang out for a few days you know if you got four people in your family. Um, it doesn't got to be huge and that wouldn't cost very much. It would be pretty easy to do um, and then you could you could have all that material in place and all you'd have to do close the door and hang out for a little bit. Just make sure you think about sanitation, make sure you think about you know, power and food and water and all those kind of, uh, you know, things. But if you've got a bug out bag and you've got it packed properly, you could probably just grab each person's bug out bag, throw it in there, take a little luggable loo, uh, you know, porta potty kind of thing with some, some, uh, trash bags to keep it all sealed up with the, all the nasty stuff sealed up in, and you're probably going to be fine. Cause chances are, if you had to stay in one of those, you're probably not gonna have to go to the bathroom very much anyway. Okay. So that is how to stay safe from nuclear fallout. It's pretty basic stuff, guys. It's not that big of a deal. Nuclear war is not the end of the world. It is not something that is, you know, like I hear this people say this all the time, oh my gosh, if there was a nuclear war, I wouldn't even want to survive. Yes, you would. And it's easy to do with just a little bit of preparation and level-headed thinking. You can absolutely survive a nuclear war, okay? Yes, there are gonna be other problems. There are some environmental issues we have to worry about, but if you've been preparing, if you've been listening to the advice that people like myself and Bear Independent and you know Joe Fox and a whole bunch of other people, uh, Leatherneck Prepper and Renaissance Marine and you know lots of other people have been giving you, then um, you're going to be able to survive this thing and you're going to be able to get through it. Okay, it's not that big a deal. It's not you know uh, some doomsday scenario where um, you know we just, we can't live through it. That's just not the case. It's not the reality. So. If you guys like this content, let me know uh, in the comments below and please like it and share it, uh, you know, on different uh, social media platforms. That would be great. And don't forget to subscribe. Uh, I'm going to have more lessons like this talking about this kind of thing for nuclear radiation um, and, and surviving a nuclear war uh, here in the not too distant future. So make sure to stay tuned. Thanks. And don't forget to live the six P's. Proper prior preparation prevents poor performance. Stay safe, guys.